Gentlemen there. Actually, would you mind just waiting one second? Sorry, it's just that these people up here have been waiting for some time. So I'll just go to in the middle here and I'll come back to you just for one second. In the middle there. Professor Dawkins. Thanks very much for what you're doing. I know that uh, at least a few friends of mine have been, uh, had their lives changed by the books you've written. It's, it's easy for us sometimes in an increasingly secular Britain to feel smug when we see the levels of belief there still are in the United States of America. Yet it also seems that the levels of rationality are not uh, increasing in Britain. Um, a colleague of mine claims to be an, an atheist, uh, will not believe anything unless there's good evidence. In fact, she claims to be a typical Sagittarian in that respect. <laughs> As a teacher, uh, I'd appreciate your, uh, your ideas as to how we can go about promoting rational thinking. Thank you, yes, a very interesting question. Um, the passage about crystals that I read was preceded by uh, a bit about people who believe in crystal healing. You know, you sort of, you place crystals at the four corners of your bath while you're having a bath and, and somehow healing energy seeps out from the crystals and things. So religion is not the only form of irrational superstition. There's plenty of others. And when people give up religion, they don't often resort to rationality. They often resort to um, other kinds of superstitious nonsense. So, what do we do about it? I think teach critical ways of thought. So when we teach science, obviously we need to teach what we know about science, and that's exciting and interesting. But teach, in particular, the scientific way of thinking, the skeptical way of asking questions. What is the evidence for your belief? If you believe that so-and-so is true, why do you believe it? What's the evidence for it? Is this the kind of belief that we have acquired through evidence, or is it the kind of belief that people just made up, or the kind of belief that is just handed down by tradition from generation to generation? Is it the kind of belief that people simply feel inside themselves, in which case it's worthless? Is it the kind of belief that uh, people have just, be, just read in some book? If the book itself was not written on the basis of evidence, then again, it's, it's worthless. I don't think it's that difficult to teach critical thinking. You're not indoctrinating, you're not teaching a lot of facts, you're teaching children how to think for themselves, how to ask questions, how to react skeptically to statements of belief from other people. It's, it's obviously hard for a young child to do that, but even a young child, I think, could be taught to ask the right kind of question. What is the evidence for this? You're a teacher, you probably know more about this than I do, have more experience about, of, of this than I do. I certainly uh, do try to promote critical thinking skills, but um, as, as you say, I do feel that isn't indoctrination, but sometimes even that is considered to be indoctrination by colleagues. Obviously, we want to stay away from indoctrination as far as possible. It's always very hard to draw the distinction, but I think teaching children to think critically is about as far from indoctrination as you can get. Okay, let's go to this gentleman over here. He's been waiting a while. Yeah, I'd just like to ask uh, Richard's position on the, the Large Hadron Collider that's coming on this 2008 this summer and how that's going to be a fun little change, almost like Darwin's beagle when he went to Galapagos. Will that actually hammer one of the final nails in the proverbial coffin of conventional religion as we find that unified physics model of basically the Higgins boson particle and, and basically every particle that this universe is made out of? I think when we do find this, and I think that we will do find, we will, we will do find this, will actually cement another kind of layer on religion is irrelevant to us in the way that, that science can offer us more, much more answers than religion, in the way that science can answer the questions that it seemingly is unanswerable by religion, in the way that you have to make that leap of faith to kind of circumvent that these 
these kind of dangerous questions that don't really have an answer, but science is providing an answer, it's much more theoretically possible okay. than... Let's, let's get an answer to um, some of that if we can. <laughs> I know it's, it's a bit of a... Well, I'm, I'm not a physicist. Question, but I just, wanted to, I just wanted to find out your position yeah. on it. Well, let's, let's get his answer I'm then. So, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I had That's to, okay, uh, let's, let's just uh, get his answer. I, I, I'm not a physicist. I, I, I visited CERN, the, the establishment near Geneva that you must be referring to. Um, it is a most moving experience. Uh, it's, I think, a 26 mile, is it radius or diameter, um, circular um, acceleration um, tunnel. And it's vast, it's huge. And when you go down there, you go it's deep underground, and um, it's an international operation. It's one of the most moving experiences I think I've ever had uh, to have this in international team of people cooperating together, working together to batter down the very frontiers of understanding. It looks to me as though theoretical physics has been stuck at an impasse for quite a number of years now, waiting for experimental physics to catch up. And experimental physics just might provide gigantic breakthroughs, as the question suggests, this year, next year, really very soon. Um, as to what effect that might have on people's religious beliefs, who knows? Uh, for somebody of my bias, it would, it would um, provide yet more evidence of our deep understanding of the universe, but at the same time, evidence of how much deeper we've got to go. Because every new breakthrough that modern physics achieves seems to uncover new vistas of mystery which were not dreamed of before. And if you look at the history of 20th century physics through um, special relativity, general relativity, and the various advances in, in quantum mechanics, each one seems more amazing than the one before. And it doesn't look as though that's going to stop. Some physicists think it is going to stop. So I have an almost religious feeling about this, that, 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 the, that the mysteries of the universe are tantalizing, intriguing, and wonderful. Um, Others may respond in a more directly religious way and say this only um, lays bare the glory of God even, even further. So I think it may be that there will be no um, obvious tendency for the advances that CERN achieves to um, go either for or against conventional religion. I naturally hope that it will go against. Do you have any fears about it? There are some people expressing fears about what they're going to do in that tunnel in Switzerland in terms of well, the impact um, that recreating the Big Bang might have? Y yes, I, 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 th I think there's a probably un unrealistic... I mean, th there are some people who feel that, you know, when will it all end and, and, and maybe the whole world will, will blow up or something. Um, physicists that I've talked to say that's extremely unlikely. I hope they're right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You'll forgive me, sir, if I don't come back to you. I just want to, to move over here to this lady. Uh, Professor Dawkins, uh, when you spoke about the Selfish Gene book, you mentioned that we're effectively a collection of genes whose ancestors have survived for generations. While fully taking into account the previous questioner about the, the rapid growth in human population, in the affluent Western world particularly, more and more people are choosing not to have children. Does that mean that there's some kind of arms race going on between our evolved intelligence and the genes, on the one hand, the genes wanting to recreate, and on the other hand, free human choice to not have children. It's a very fascinating idea, isn't it, that, um, that the natural selection of the selfish genes has created our brains as a, as a tool for their own survival. And when it, when, when it was first created by natural selection in the Pleistocene era on the plains of Africa, it was a tool for making us good at gathering and hunting. But now, um, the brain has, in a sense, overreached itself from the point of view of the selfish genes. So that the brain has discovered, for example, contraception, which is a very anti-selfish gene thing to do. Uh, the brain has discovered um, art and music and all sorts of pleasures which distract us 
from the real business of getting down to it and making babies. Um, I rather subscribe to my friend and colleague Steven Pinker, who's an, who uh, believes strongly in the view of the selfish gene, but he says, I, Steven Pinker, have no intention of having children, and if my genes don't like it, my genes can go jump in the lake. <laughs> so there is a sort of rebellion on our hands. The brains, the big brain which was manufactured by the selfish genes for the propagation of selfish genes has now rebelled and has devoted itself to all sorts of other pleasures and amusements.